Which brings us back then to the role of the media pressure. They wouldn't have been driving and running around at that rate, would they, if, if there wasn't all this pressure, the hounding? Do you think that was a contributory factor, more realistically speaking? There is no doubt that Henri Paul was instructed to lose the paparazzi who were following them. There is also no doubt, I quote people I interviewed after her death in, Di in the Real Diana, which was published in America in 1998 and in the UK in 2004. I quote people to whom she spoke, who she rang up to tell them where she was going to be for them to follow her. You cannot blame the reporters who were following her at her behest and her invitation. If anybody deserves partial blame for triggering the events that caused that accident. It is Diana herself. She rang them up, told them where she was going to be. You know, think about it for two seconds. They were safely ensconced at the Ritz. They didn't have to leave to go back to Dodie's flat. It was a cat and mouse game. You know, I think when the press behaves badly, they should be pilloried. When they do not behave badly, they should not be blamed for going about their business. If a celebrity of any description rings up the press, and Diana systematically rang up the press, don't take my word for it. Read, uh, Gosh, what is his name? Uh, Nicholas Coleridge's memoirs about how he asked Diana to lunch at Vogue House, Carlton House rules. Nobody's supposed to know. Everything is a big secret. He's walking her out to her car afterwards, and there's a paparazzo. And when he checks into it, it turns out Diana had leaked it to the press herself. She was notorious for doing this. Meghan and Harry do the same thing. Meghan and Harry, three of, they have sunshine sacks, and three and four times a week, they pay these people to put them in the newspapers. Then they are talking about being hounded. I'm sorry, you know. You do, you're not hounded by people you have given invitations to. And we need to accept the fact that if you're responsible for issuing the invitation, you're also responsible for the outcome of what happens when the invitation is acted upon. What about the driver's alcohol consumption then? Was that more of a contributory factor? Well, I have actually interviewed everybody concerned for the book. And, you know, Henri Paul's alcohol factor is supposed to have been higher than before. There is no doubt that he drank. I think he had a pastis before, just before. He got up. It's all there on tape. He got up. He got down on his haunches and tied his shoelaces 90 seconds before getting into the car. It's all there on tape. You tell me how it is possible for someone's faculties to be impaired if they execute such an intricate balancing act. One of the American, you know, you lived in America. I lived in America. One of the standard things in America for drunk drivers is to, is to walk a straight line. Much easier to walk a straight line than to get down on your haunches and tie your shoelaces. So that suggests to me that Henri Paul's faculties were not particularly impaired. The evidence of what happened is very clear. 
if you wish to go into the evidence, it is very clear. And I went into it exhaustively, not only to write the book, but to update the book after the inquest. There, the evidence suggests, do you want to know what the, t what the evidence suggests? Yes, because it's really simple what the evidence suggests. They leave the Ritz. They are being chased by the paparazzi. Henri Paul's instructions are lose them. So he's trying to lose them. I had a flat in Paris. I know Paris very well. I don't know if you know Paris very no. well. Well, most people don't, and that's part of the problem. But these tunnels have like sort of big roundabouts, and you get it's and you get in. Anyway, the Alma Tunnel is also it's pretty much you'd have to be actually sleeping or maybe even comatose to have an accident there normally. He jump, he, he starts into the tunnel and there is a fiat in front by him and he clips the fiat. There's no doubt about it. The physical evidence was there. The Mercedes, as it was entering the tunnel, clipped the white fiat. It is my opinion, having spoken to Mercedes, endless people, police, etc., that it is at that point that the airbags deployed. Airbags, what nobody tells you is airbags can deploy if you shave past something. You do not have to, sorry, slam into something. If you shave past it, airbags can deploy. The airbags did not deploy when the car hit the 13th column because there were two eyewitnesses who I interviewed and I quote in my book. They, one of them saw everything that happened. There were no airbags deployed, but the airbags had deployed. When did they deploy? The only thing that makes sense is, as the car was entering the tunnel, it clipped, and it did clip the Fiat, the airbags deployed. The evidence thereafter suggests that the airbags were deployed as it entered the tunnel, because Henri Paul once an airbag deploys, you are completely covered with it. Blinded. You're not only blinded, it fills up the whole of the car. Uh, so, so not only are you blinded, you're, it's, you're like covered in cloth for only about 30 or so seconds. But you are complete, not only are you blinded, you are completely, Im it's almost immobilized. The car was in drive when it hit, when it clipped the car. The car was in neutral when it hit the tunnel. That tells you, the evidence tells you that Henri Paul moved the car from drive into neutral when the airbags deployed. Unless the airbag itself moved the car, which I don't know that that's possible. I, and it's never occurred to me until just now. That, but it's possible, I suppose, that the airbag, did. if the airbag didn't, he definitely did, because the car was in neutral. The car entered the tunnel with the engine roaring. An engine does not roar when a car is in drive. It only roars at high speed when the car is in neutral. There are several witnesses on the bridge and in the tunnel who heard the car engine roaring. There was a car in front of, in the tunnel, and the French, remember, France is reversed. So, so everything is reversed. As the car enters the tunnel, there is a car in front of it going at a reasonable speed. And it sees the couple 
they see this car thundering down towards them, making the most god-awful roaring sound. And he immediately sped up to avoid being rammed by the Mercedes that is hurtling down towards him. And it is obviously at that point that the airbags lost, you know, they, they, they sort of stopped. Free, and he and Henri Paul could see again because he then made the fatal error, and it was fatal, of trying to avoid slamming into the back of the car by going into the other lane. But when a car is in neutral, you have no control over it. It is only when it is in drive that you have control over. And this, remember, would have happened all in a matter of seconds. And he hurtled past by and slammed in to one side and then into the 13th column as the other car managed to. And that is what happened. And what it tells you is that, and he was killed immediately because the girl saw the whole thing in her rear view mirror and she saw him slam into the, and she saw the car constant, the engine concertina in and kill him as she saw the whole thing. And it then moved further back and killed Dodie as well. And that's what happens. And Diana wasn't dead. Diana was still talking. She was dazed, but she wasn't dead. Because I interviewed the doctor who, Dr. Maye, I think he was called, M-A-I-L-I, Maye or whatever, it was, you know, a French name. And, uh, and he's the one who alighted upon the and made her comfortable. And my brother-in-law, I have to tell you, is a top cardiologist in America. And I checked with him what happened in terms of the injuries. And he said, once they moved her because she had a pulmonary vein torn, as long as she was crouched or sitting up, she, was, she would not have bled out. Once they moved her to make her prone more comfortable, which is what they did when they moved her out of the car, that's when she started to bleed out. And that's what, the whole thing was a tragic accident. But she said, my God, my God, what's happened? I mean, she was stunned, but she was conscious at first. How long did she last after she was moved? Well, she started to bleed out as soon as, as they, they, what, because what they did, once they got her out of the car, they put her on, on a sort of lilo thingy. And what people don't realize as well, and they say, oh, it took so long to get her to the hospital. The SAMU in France, it's, they are effectively uh, vehicles that are moving intensive care units. So, I mean, and every time her heart rate and her blood pressure, G, they, they'd stop to stabilize her, then move on. And they, because, and it's, but she was getting proper medical attention. But once she was moved, she had bled out enough that even if she survived, she'd have been a vegetable. So the fact of the matter is it's merciful that she died. But as long as she wasn't moved, she, she was, it's like if I plunge a knife into you and you, and that knife stays in, you have a chance. If I pull it out, the likelihood is you're going to die. Another lesson. Yeah. So 